What role does Africa play in a global economy? African countries say they're marginalised and complain global financial policies hamper their access to capital markets. So what should be done to integrate the continent into the world economy? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Emily Angwin. Africa's influence on issues of global importance remains far too narrow and marginalised. African leaders made those comments earlier this week in Washington, D.C., as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank held annual meetings. The IMF's latest economic outlook for Africa shows the region faces uncertainty as countries' attempts to bounce back from the pandemic have been hampered by the war in Ukraine. Regional leaders appealed for the continent not to be forgotten. They say assistance would have more impact if contributors listen to those they're helping who better understand the conditions on the ground. The governor of Kenya's central bank says emerging markets have become collateral damage, saying innocent bystanders are being punished. He says a failure to address spillover effects will have costly spillback consequences for the world. For now, African nations face having to borrow more to keep their people from going hungry. South Africa's finance minister says the continent's leaders have little faith in the developed world after it's missed its target to channel $100 billion per year by 2020 to help developing nations cope with climate change. He also went on saying we were proponents of the debt relief, but the design now we're not happy with. So let's take a closer look at the challenges the continent is facing. Growth this year is expected to slow sharply by more than one percentage point to about 3.6%. That means it's too slow to make up for the ground lost to the pandemic. Rising food and energy prices are impacting the region's most vulnerable people. And public debt and inflation are at levels not seen in decades. Inflation is expected to remain high this year and the next at 12.2% and 9.6%. Okay, let's bring in our guests from Dakar. We have Deuda Semben, a distinguished non-resident fellow at the Centre for Global Development and former executive director at the International Monetary Fund. From Rabat, we have Abdel Malik Alawi, he is an economist and CEO and founder of Gaypar Group. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being on the program. Uh, Dauda, I'll start with you. Can we talk about an African economy so broadly when it contains 54 countries, which is so diverse? Yes, um, thank you very much for having us. Um, yes, indeed, you are right that there is a lot of heterogeneity among African economies. You're talking about 54 countries with 54 different circumstances. But at the same time, there are countries that are facing the same global challenges that every other economy around the world is facing, whether we are talking about the high uh, food and energy prices, whether we are talking about high inflation or actually the impact of uh, high uh, inflation on secu food security. Uh, so we're talking also about the impact of climate change. I think all of those uh, African economies are facing those same issues uh, coming straight from the pandemic. So which, is, which means that I guess uh, they, uh, they need uh, some uh, policy solutions that are very much uh, uh, tailored to their circumstances. Um, Abdel Malik, what are some of the ramifications for Africa if global financial policies aren't reformed to better serve the continent? Well, actually, you know, uh, Africa, as uh, you mentioned, is very diverse. We Africans only become Africans after the quarterfinals of the, of the World Cup, really. But before that, we are Moroccans, Algerians, uh, uh, from Senegal, and we have different issues that are at stake. But um, the issue of financing the development of Africa uh, is at the center of the global conversation because it is in Africa that you will find the raw materials for the ecological transition. Everything that you have inside your phone is located in Africa. If you want extractive industries for the future, they are in Africa. But our continent is underfunded. It has been underfunded for the last 25 years, 
And if we look at the words of economist Benjamin Graham, he says, the market in the short term is a voting machine, but in the long term, it's a weighing machine. Africa has proved that it can fast, uh, fasten its development, that it can, can go much faster, but still we're having a bad reputation when it comes to financing our development, even though we are minor league players when it comes to corruption and to so many hindrances that, uh, that are against us. Yeah, one of those issues is the levels of public debt, particularly across Eastern and Southern Africa's low-income countries. They have doubled over the last decade. Is the management of debt a key role here? And I'll address that question to you, uh, Daouda. Yes, um, indeed, you're right that I've seen uh, since uh, for the past several uh, years, there has been actually a huge build-up in debt in many uh, countries. And that's not just in Africa, it's uh, actually all around the world. But in, particular, in, in Africa in particular, there has been actually quite a um, uh, you know, strong build-up of debt in some countries as they try to respond to the pandemic crisis, as they try also to respond to legitimate need in, uh, in, in building infrastructure and also responding to the demand for, from the population. What it has done, it, it has actually created a situation where many low-income countries in Africa are now in what, in, uh, what the IMF call high risk of debt distress or in actually debt distress. So what it means is, I guess, uh, African policymakers, but also in a partnership with the international community, needs to come up with solutions. Why? Because I think if you look at actually the reason why debt has increased in many African countries, it is to respond to a global uh, challenge, which was the pandemic, but also to make sure that they respond to the need for addressing climate change. Those are what uh, we economists would call public, global public goods. And when we are talking about global public goods, we are talking about actually shared responsibilities between national authorities and global authorities. So what I'm saying here is with that uh, debt buildup, I think there is a responsibility primary responsibility for, from African countries to find solutions, but it's a shared responsibility with the global community. So what it means is for those countries that are not necessarily in debt distress, they need to be able to borrow in affordable terms. And I think this is the responsibility of uh, the African um, government to make sure that, that they do have the right condition to do so. But at the same time, also the global community needs to make sure that African countries and low-income countries in general from around the world can they have access to an adequate level of, uh, of, of, of borrowing, but also at affordable, uh, uh, in affordable, affordable condition. Now, for those countries that are already in debt distress, those with very much high level of debt, they need to be able to restructure their debt. And I think the international community, starting with the G20, has actually come up with a, uh, a common debt framework. Unfortunately, the, question, the problem is so far the three countries that are from Africa that apply for me have not been able so far to get actually a resolution of their uh, these countries but also for any other countries that might be in similar situation. Let's look at some of Africa's larger economies now, the likes of Nigeria, South Africa and Morocco. Abdel Malik, you're in Rabat, in Morocco. What role does that country play in the economic situation across the continent? Well, in a nutshell, Morocco has been pursuing a very strong African agenda under the leadership of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, because after the financial crisis of 2008, our traditional partners, which were Europe, had very, very slow growth rate. Today, I can tell you that Morocco is the second largest investor in Africa and the first investor in West Africa. But this is very important because we witness that the conversation is changing completely. If you just look at last week, which country uh, received a warning from the IMF? It was the UK. It was not an African country. So there is a momentum for large economies and, and African countries that want to act as catalysts and hubs for exchanges between Europe, the US, and, uh, uh, and Southeast Asia to be in a place where they can broker the global economic conversation and be able to, to be a catalyst for the development of Africa. This is the ambition of Morocco. In Morocco, we have a king with a vision and we are a kingdom with a plan. And in our plan, Africa is on top of the priorities.
Let's bring in our guest now from Washington, D.C. We have Pierre Tanchao, a senior director at ASG's Africa Practice, where he advises clients on trade, investment and governance on the continent. Pierre, thanks so much for being on the program. I wanted to ask you about the informal economy in Africa and if you can firstly explain to our audience what the informal economy is and how that makes up nearly 83% of employment in Africa and what impact that informal economy has on policy making? Well, thanks for having me on. Um, you've essentially said it all, the, the importance of the informal economy and uh, the development of, of the continent. I mean, many times economists, when they talk about how Africa is gonna move forward, they talk about uh, boosting production, uh, manufacturing, uh, infrastructure, and some of the larger products, which is right. But the informal economy is really the number one employer on the continent. It is the way African citizens themselves are able to uh, to meet their economic needs. I mean, we're talking about uh, from the mom and pop shop in the market, uh, all the way to maybe smaller entrepreneurs, but that are on the verge of breaking into the middle uh, middle class of the continent. So. The uh, emergence and the importance of the uh, informal economy is not lost on a lot of African policymakers. Um, but to be quite honest, sometimes uh, what makes the most splash, not only to voters, but to the international communities, are bigger projects on a, on a larger scale. So while it is absolutely important for policymakers to look at the informal economy and, and ways to help boost its efficacy, uh, it's not always the number one priority to uh, African policymakers. And it absolutely should. I noticed, uh, Dauda, you were nodding there. Did you want to contribute? Yes, I, um, I was actually last week in Washington attending the annual meeting of the IMF and the World Bank. And I believe, I think right now uh, at this stage, uh, we are talking about a situation where not only African economies, but the global economy is under stress because of the uh, growing level of debt, because of the shocks that are emanating from the war in Ukraine, because of uh, the shocks that are um, emanating from, uh, from the environment, the climate change, and any, you know, in, actually in Africa also because of security uh, um, crisis in some countries. So all of that requires that uh, the international community and African uh, policymakers do their best to mobilize both domestic and, uh, uh, and resources from uh, uh, from in, from from from, uh, from uh, the international um, uh, economy. So when we talk about the domestic resources, we are talking about making sure that everyone in the country be able to contribute to a fair share of uh, the revenue that are needed to respond to the to, to the need of the population. Of course, depending on how much how um, high their, uh, their revenue is and also how rich they are. And I believe, I think uh, the, 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 the issue that we certainly face also is how we can make sure that while we do, do, do so, we find innovative uh, instruments to do so. Uh, let me give you one example, for instance. I think during the annual meeting last week, it has been a lot of questions about what uh, the SDR uh, allocation that the IMF did. As you recall, it was $650 billion that were allocated to the 190 uh, uh, members of the IMF. And out of that amount, Africa only got the territory billion out of it. And uh, I think after that, knowing that this wasn't enough to respond to the need of Africa, the international community through the G20 uh, committed to reallocate up to 100 billion. At this stage, it's not yet actually, that commitment has not been fulfilled yet, although there has been um, uh, um, uh, some account necessarily available yet. They would go through the IMF, but I believe also African countries would gain from having uh, some of those resources actually channel through the African Development Bank so that they can also uh, be able to base on their leveraging, which means that actually from every one dollar that you would give them, they can multiply it by many as much as four to be able to lend to uh, SMEs and other uh, low income uh, or low uh, uh, small businesses. Yes, and just to, to re reiterate what uh, Uda just said, of the IMF's $650 billion global allocation in special drawing rights, only $33 billion, which is just 5%, was allocated to Africa. Abdel Malik, if I can address this question to you, and it's slightly of a different um, topic, China has become a key political and economic power in the uh, in the continent. Where does Beijing come in in all of this? 
Well, I was wondering when uh, you were going to pronounce the name China, because our traditional partners, the US and Europe, are always talking about China's involvement uh, in Africa. But we have to say that we in Africa are pragmatists, because when it comes to Africa's development, uh, the world has to understand that failure is not an option, because it will be a global failure. Every year, 14 million young Africans enter the job market, and only 7 million of those 14 million enter the formal sector. And China has been a driving force in so many sectors uh, in Africa, and they're having a partnership that is very different from the partnership that Africans have with Europeans or with Americans, which is a partnership no questions asked about internal politics. They're not meddling with uh, political issues with African countries. So, of course, China is an important partner, a partner with a long-term agenda. And uh, the Chinese are investing heavily in agriculture, in tech, uh, and it's normal that there is uh, this competition. But I have to say, we as Africans are agnostic. We want to work with every country, every superpower that uh, is sharing our ambition to develop the continent. Pierre, I noticed you were nodding profusely there. What did you want to add to the conversation? No, I, I agree with my esteemed panelists that uh, there has been a lot of conversation around Chinese uh, investment in the China, Chinese role. I'll just paraphrase something I heard that the Director General of the WTO say, Dr. Uh, uh, Gozi Kondroy Wela, where she would essentially compare Africa to a, a young, beautiful bride, and it's okay to have many different suitors and essentially go into the suitor uh, that, that fits her needs the most. So. I'm in full agreement in, in the fact that the continent needs to deal with uh, whoever sees it as a partner. Whether or not China has a vision of the continent, I think that's another part of the debate. But at the end of the day, it should certainly not preclude African countries from uh, diversifying their partnership pool, as long as those partnerships are beneficial to the African people. I think it's just interesting we're talking about China as well and kind of the debt relief and debt solution part of uh, the equation because, yes, we have heard the role of China and, and how much debt it holds. But one thing we're forgetting is uh, private lenders, including bondholders and oil traders, really hold 35%. Uh, Western private lenders hold 35% of uh, uh, African external debts and up to only 13% or 12% of the Chinese debt. And the average interest rate on debt payment owed to China in uh, last year was 2.7%. Whereas for non-Chinese private debt uh, holders, it was 5%. So you do need to have a shift in uh, only focusing on the Chinese lending, especially as we talk about debt relief, but also talk about the private lenders who can play a bigger role. There really won't be any debt relief and a solution to debt um, uh, uh, that the African countries are facing right now if the whole landscape, the whole universe of debt lenders is not involved, not just the Chinese. Let's move away then from China and look at the continent as a whole and the African continental free trade area. Pierre, I'll direct this question to you. What is it? Explain that to our audience. And why is it so beneficial for the continent that it works? I think the African uh, free trade continental area, I think, is one of the biggest um, fiscal and uh, trade development that we have seen in this side of the century, uh, to be quite honest, because it creates the largest free trade area in the world at the moment, um, only competing is the WTO, which encapsulates the, the whole world, and essentially is an attempt by African states to harmonize uh, regulatory frameworks, to harmonize laws that will allow uh, intra-Africa trade, as we call it, in, 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 and facilitate the movement of goods and people uh, through the borders of different African states. As you will know, contrary to what some people still believe in the Western part of the world, Africa is not a country. It is made up of many different countries and many different uh, profiles and economic opportunities as well. So the idea is, in, in the own segmented and fragmented um, um, uh, way that they are set up right now, African countries, they won't be able to compete on the global stage compared to some of the, the other trade blocks like the European Union, for example. So the idea is to harmonize and make uh, uh, the African continent one big trade block that would not only give it muscle on the global stage, but most importantly, and this is really the number one driver of the AFCFTA, is to drive 
uh, local development, to drive local entrepreneurship, local consumption, local manufacturing, local production, uh, all of the things that we've seen have made other parts of the world grow. You look at the Chinese example, you look at you know other countries in Asia like South Korea, or you look again at the European Union, all of these blocks uh, have really been created and, and have developed through the production of the local uh, and consumption of the local goods. So that's what the ASCFTA is trying to do, harmonize uh, not only at a regulatory level, but also at a developmental level, harmonize African goals and uh, essentially boost the economic, um, uh, economic uh, prospects of African citizens. Speaking of resources, African countries have massive natural resources that they can tap into, and I'm conscious that we're, we're running short of time. So, Abdel Malik, I'll address this to you. How can big African hubs like Morocco help shore up the leverage for the continent in the context where natural resources are badly needed, especially as a result of the Ukraine war? I mean, that's a big issue. I mean, the, in Morocco, as you know, we're the world's largest producer of phosphate, so we have a direct impact on uh, agriculture. And the key is very simple. Uh, we need to go up uh, in the industrialization ladder, and we need to fill in all those gaps and uh, enable local manufacturing. And for this, we need investment. Uh, that's, the, that's the absolute center point of every development attempt in trying to create those hubs. The second thing is that we Africans have to work better on the ease of doing business. We have to fight brain drain because there are key issues. And to, in that point, I mean, I would like to stress out something very important that we as Africans and as Moroccans were particularly shocked by the declarations of the head of the external relations of the EU, Joseph Borrell, who said, uh, two days ago that uh, in Europe they succeeded in creating the garden and they are now surrounded by the jungle and they're afraid that the jungle might take over this garden. But he forgot one thing. Uh, the elephant in the room is that Europe and the U.S. are taking our resources and the most important resource, which is our talents. They're preventing uh, illegal migrations, but they are easing uh, the brain drain and talents to go. So in Africa, we need a global initiative to retain our talents so we can have industries that are talent-based, flourish, and help us develop more industrial sectors and have those clusters with ecosystems in industry, in automotive, in cars, in all industries that are not affected by the fourth industrial re uh, revolution, which is destroying blue-collar and white-collar jobs. But we need to take this to another level. We need a new global conversation with Europe, with the U.S., in order to address this talent question. Uh, Dauda, we only have one minute left, so I'll leave the final response to you. We've been talking about the ramifications for Africa, but what are the ramifications for other parts of the world if global financial policies aren't reformed to better serve African countries? And if you allow me actually to quickly contribute to what has just been said, we started sure. talking about the global challenges. We started this discussion talking about the global challenges facing the global economy, but also facing Africa. And now we are talking about all of those opportunities that Africa has to offer, about the free trade area, the natural resources that you talked about. I could also talk about the growing middle class, which uh, the African Development Bank uh, estimated uh, it has tripled between 1980 and 2010. So all of that actually showed that Africa actually has a lot to leverage on. But for that to happen, I think the, the global financial system has to be ready to support Africa, but also all the regions that are in similar situation. And for that, um, the multilateral development bank has a big role to play, particularly the World Bank. And I believe, I think, the recent report that was um, um, commissioned by the G20, which actually required the multilateral development bank in general to uh, increase their capacity to mobilize more private capital should be actually given the right follow-up so that, I guess, Africa and other uh, developing countries in general and emerging market uh, economies can benefit a lot from their lending uh, capacity. Plenty of moving parts to this issue. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, your insights and your passion. Thanks to our guests, Daouda Semben, Abdel Malik Alawi and Pierre Tancho.
Thank you too for watching at home. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story. From me, Emily Angwin and the team here, bye for now.